Welcome everyone. Really excited to welcome you all to, to this month's Boris Bloch lecture. Um, I'm really honoured to introduce Dr. Ethel Dreda Nakimula Mapungu, and I hope I pronounced that right, Ethel, and just do correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, Ethel is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Makareri University in Uganda. Her academic journey blossomed at Makareri, where she undertook both her undergraduate and postgraduate training in medicine and psychiatry. She obtained a doctoral degree in psychiatric epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. For more than 20 years, Ethel's career has been at the intersection of mental health and HIV, offering care, education and research in mental health. Her responsibilities have spanned teaching, searching and providing care for individuals living with mental health challenges. I think we have a lot to learn. Over the last decade, her research endeavours have pivoted towards the design and evaluation of culturally appropriate psychotherapy for people living with HIV in Uganda. Her team's trailblazing efforts have been recognised and featured in the STEAM publications such as The Lancet, Lancet HIV and Lancet Global Health. She developed a cost-effective group support psychotherapy programme improving medication adherence and viral suppression. I mean, really remarkable findings. Recognised internationally, she's received the 2016 Elsevier Foundation Award, a National Independence Medal of Honour, and she was featured on BBC's 100 Most Inspiring and Influential Women 2020. In 2023, she was honoured to join the World Psychiatric Association Section Executive Committee and the World Federation of Psychotherapy Council representing Uganda. We really are so honoured to have you here with us. Um, I'm just going to switch so that you can see we've got a good audience here in the room. We've also got plenty of people online. Can I pass over to you? Thank you so much for coming. Ian Amma. Ben Stein. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Helen, for that kind introduction. Uh, greetings to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this lecture. I am thrilled to be in Glasgow today, virtually. Well, I'm going to talk to you about our latest research, uh, which uncovers groundbreaking evidence demonstrating how a mental health intervention, group support psychotherapy, can improve not only mental health, but also physical health outcomes among persons living with HIV AIDS. Our 10 years of research have shown a spotlight on the integral connection between the mind and the body, challenging us to rethink the conventional paradigms of medical care, particularly for those living with chronic medical conditions like HIV. So this is going to be the outline of my lecture today. Uh, we'll understand what mind and body connection is. Uh, we'll highlight some key studies that support the mind-body connection in the HIV mental health context. And then I will go into our research that we've conducted in Uganda, uh, specifically showing you the mediators of uh, GSP effects on depression and then the mediators of GSP effects on HIV treatment outcomes. And lastly, I'll be discussing the implications for health service delivery in Uganda and beyond. So what is the mind-body connection? 
The mind-body connection refers to a complex interplay between our mental health and our physical health. Uh, common mental health problems such as high stress levels, uh, anxiety, depression can manifest in physical uh, symptoms. And also they can exacerbate uh, pre-existing medical conditions. Similarly, uh, physical health conditions can contribute to mental health issues. Uh, for example, the case of HIV, uh, we know that the HIV virus penetrates the blood brain barrier and the virus uh, directly affects brain structures. And if those structures uh, regulate our mood and behavior, uh, we are going to have problems. We are going to have emotional problems and behavioral problems. So understanding this connection is crucial for designing uh, healthcare interventions. Now, we all know what, we all have a good idea of what um, physical health is. Uh, basically, it refers to the state of our body and how well the system, the, the body systems are functioning. However, when it comes to mental health, we all struggle to understand what mental health is. So whenever I'm, I'm speaking about uh, um, um, mental health, I do want to define what um, mental health is uh, so that we are all um, on the same page. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, mental health is a state of well-being where one is able to realize their potential in life. Uh, one is able to cope with stressful life situations. Uh, one is able to make meaningful decisions that build you up. And one is able to nurture deep confiding relationships as well as work productively and make a meaningful contribution to one's um, community. So it's always good for us to uh, do a regular check on our mental health. And on the screen is a self-checking exercise that I usually <laughs> do to track my own mental health. Um, and I usually ask my audience uh, to do the same. So on a scale of zero to 100, uh, please feel free to rate yourself on those five attributes of, of uh, mental health and see how well you're doing. And um, uh, uh, you can share with us in the chat box for those who are on, online. And um, take an average of, of your scores. And I'm going to show you shortly what to do with that, with that average. So our mental health lies on a spectrum. On one end, it, is, it can be on one extreme end, it can be excellent. And on the other extreme end, it can be uh, broken. So, some, so we all lie on this spectrum and you can get your average score and place it on this uh, spectrum. Uh, if excellent refers to 100% and uh, uh, severe mental disorder refers to 0%, we all lie somewhere along this um, spectrum. Our daily goal is to make sure we're as close as possible to the excellent end, you know? And uh, the number one thing that's going to push our, our, our mental health, to shift our mental health, is um, stressful life problems. And research has shown that, um, uh, research on the mind-body connection uh, shows that a chronic stress will shift uh, our mental health and subsequently impact our physical health through hormonal responses, uh, inflammation, as well as um, gene expression. So when I talk about stress, I also want to define what stress is because we use this term loosely uh, and uh, sometimes we may not know actually what stress is. Many times in the past, I never used to know when people said, uh, well, if you want to lose weight, make sure you manage your stress. I, I, I didn't know what that that meant. So I always want to define what, what stress is. And there are very many definitions, but I like this one by Lazarus and Folkman, who describe, uh, uh, who, who define stress as a combination of physical, mental, and emotional reactions that you will experience when the demands on you exceed the personal and social resources that you're able to mobilize 
to meet those demands. Now, the thing is uh, about stress is that we actually need a, um, um, some bit of stress, you know? We need a certain level of stress to function normally. That level of stress will give us an adequate uh, mental, physical, and emotional reaction, you know? And that reaction helps us to uh, meet the demands, to, you know, to, to meet the day-to-day -day demands that, that have been um, um, uh, placed on us. However, when the stress levels uh, increase and um, become too much, when you have a huge stress load, you know, it is not uh, good for our overall functioning. Um, a heavy stress load is going to impair your performance. Um, it's going to shift uh, your mental health from the excellent end to the red zone and uh, you may eventually uh, have a mental breakdown if you do not know how to manage um, uh, that stress, stress. So to explain more, when, when our bodies perceive uh, stress, you know, um, the hypothalamic pituitary axis is activated. So basically, uh, there's a release of corticotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, uh, which then stimulates the pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH. Uh, this hormone is going to um, act on the adrenal glands to release cortisol, which is the body's primary stress hormone. This cortisol will then release other hormones, the uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline. Uh, this will activate our sympathomimetic system. Uh, in simple terms, it basically activates our different body organs. Our heart beats faster, you know, so as to pump blood to those vital organs that need to function so that we meet the demands placed on us. So this is nature's inbuilt mechanism within all of us. So if the stress you're experiencing is just the adequate level, you're going to have <laughs> adequate stress response and it's going to serve you well, yes? But when you're experiencing a chronic stress, this um, uh, HPA axis is going to be overactivated and it's going to uh, lead to a release of excessive cortisol uh, in our bloodstream. And this um, excessive cortisol is actually uh, what uh, damages our bodies and causes uh, problems. When this is adequate and we have an adequate stress response reaction, this activates our immune system. There's increased production of cytokinins, the proteins that promote inflammation. This is all good. But when the... Uh, cortisol is excessive in the face of chronic stress, then this continuous inflammation uh, uh, damages the um, immune system. The immune system is suppressed. There's increased susceptibility to infection. And, you know, uh, then you're more prone to heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, depression, and anxiety. And interestingly, also stress has an impact on gene expression. Epigenetic changes, which are modifications that affect uh, gene expression without altering the underlying DNA sequencing, have been observed, have, have, um, <clears throat> so, They've been observed to alter our response to, to um, stress. These changes can influence the activity of genes involved in the stress response, uh, potentially predisposing individuals to stress-related disorders. Uh, for example, research has shown that um, early early life stress can result in epigenetic modifications to the genes that regulate the HPA axis that I've just 
um, talked about, potentially leading to an abnormal stress response and therefore increased risk for mental disorders. So next, I would like to just highlight a few of the studies of the mind-body connection studies uh, in the context of um, uh, uh, HIV. These studies, you know, provide the evidence of the um, adverse effects of uh, stress on the body's um, immunity. Research has shown that psychological distress can influence uh, the decline of CD4 cells, increase viral load in persons living with HIV AIDS. Also, depression, stress, and trauma have been shown to accelerate the progress of HIV. Um, a systemic review uh, of several studies on depression treatment uh, uh, showed that treating depression in persons living with HIV is associated with improvement in antiretroviral adherence. And lastly, there is uh, this study that shows an association between discrimination related trauma and sexual risk. Can I just ask the person who's just joined us, could you mute yourself? Sorry. So unfortunately, um, most of these studies have been done in, um, in uh, high, high income countries. When the HIV healthcare system was uh, being set up for the longest time in low and middle income countries, uh, mental health care of persons living with HIV AIDS um, was not uh, put into uh, consideration. Um, it was only in uh, 2015 that um, the, 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 the World Health Organization HIV treatment uh, guidelines were able to include uh, mental health care, uh, stating that um, all patients should be screened for depression. It's only in 2018 that the UN uh, addressed the topic of HIV and uh, mental health in, um, in a PCB meeting that I was able to um, attend. And when our health workers started to screen for depression, um, they didn't know what to do with these uh, clients uh, because there was no psychotherapy in our health facilities that could be used to uh, directly address um, um, it, uh, mild moderate depression treatment. Instead, um, health workers were prescribing antidepressants <coughs> to, to um, patients with mild to moderate de depression, which was in contradiction to what the World Health Organization guidelines for treating depression uh, state. Um, ideally, we're supposed to treat <clears throat> mild and moderate depression with um, psychotherapy <clears throat> first line. And if that fails, then we can go on to medication, use medi both medication and psychotherapy. So as we all know, the burden of depression is huge worldwide, but the greatest burden is, is borne by uh, individuals living in low-income countries you know, where we have eight out of 10 uh, uh, um, uh, sufferers unable to even access uh, treatment for this depression. And our research showed that one in three persons living with HIV AIDS had significant uh, depression symptoms that interfered with their um, adherence to the therapy. So these patients, you know, continue to suffer uh, with uh, suboptimum HIV treatment outcomes. So it is against the background that we developed group support psychotherapy. Uh, group support psychotherapy is a culturally sensitive first-line psychological treatment that treats depression by enhancing emotional and social support, enhancing the ability to practice positive thinking skills and generating skills. 
Uh, sorry, sorry, just a second. I'm just I'm just going to ask um, Florence. Florence, uh, like Louisa, can you mute yourself, please? Florence, can you mute yourself, please? Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, carry on. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. All right. So, group support psychotherapy is delivered once a week for eight weeks. It is delivered in a group format, and the groups are gender specific. And the health worker trained to deliver the therapy must be the same gender as the group members. The sessions may last uh, two to three hours. So I just want to quickly run through uh, the different sessions. Uh, in session one, it's basically focused on introductory issues. Uh, participants get to know each other. Uh, they get to know their therapist. Um, expectations are clarified. Ground rules are set. Uh, participants are, are made to commit to attend all the eight sessions. Uh, most importantly in this session, they are told how the group therapy works, you know, how it is going to help them alleviate their depression. And they're also informed of what they are supposed to do as participants so as to reap the benefits of this uh, group therapy. <laughs> uh, session two is about uh, psych education, about depression. Session three and four is when the participants are allowed, are given an opportunity to express their most painful problem mm -hmm. and therefore be able to release uh, strong emotions. And session five and six is when they are taught various uh, uh, positive coping skills. And in session six specifically, uh, it is dedicated to uh, coping skills for stigma and discrimination. And the last two sessions are uh, to teach the participants basic income generating skills. So we've done a number of by, um, evaluations for this therapy, starting with feasibility studies. We did a pilot randomized trial, and eventually we did a larger trial, the cluster randomized trial. And this is uh, the results of this large trial uh, I want to share with you today. Uh, this trial involved uh, 30 HIV clinics, they were spread across three districts, Kitgum, Pade, and, uh, and uh, Gulu. Um, these uh, 30 HIV clinics were randomized, and 15 of them uh, had their health workers trained in group support psychotherapy, and uh, the other 15, we trained them to deliver group HIV education. Uh, both interventions were implemented over an eight-week period, and participants were followed up uh, every six months for a period of three years. So our results were really uh, remarkable. We found that the intervention was highly effective against uh, mild to moderate depression. 99% um, of the participants were depression free uh, six, six months after the intervention in, in, in the intervention group and they remain depression-free uh, 24 months later. We also observed that uh, the intervention uh, improved uh, functioning, overall functioning of the individual. And now I want us to uh, uh, observe how the intervention was able to was able to um, achieve uh, such a significant reduction in depression. So first, we looked at um, two two variables: uh, stigma reduction and um, income generation. Because we know stigma is highly associated with depression, as well as poverty is a potent risk factor for depression. So we saw in, in, in our mediation analysis, we're able to see that um, the intervention effects were through uh, stigma reduction, 
And also we, we observed um, intervention effects through improvement of income generation. So we then uh, computed the indirect effects. And this is what we observed. Um, we observed that the indirect effects through stigma were significant, uh, but you know, small uh, compared to the effects through uh, income generation. So this basically means that the that the intervention effects through income generation were double uh, the effects through stigma. And when we look at both variables together, we see that the sequential reduction in stigma followed by an improvement in income generation um, uh, had the greatest effect on uh, reduction in depression. The greatest intervention effects on depression were achieved through a sequential reduction in stigma followed by an, an, an improvement in income generation. We also looked at two other variables that we know are associated um, with uh, depression, um, positive coping skills and, and social support uh, uh, do alleviate depression. So we wanted to see whether the data does show this. We wanted to see whether the intervention was able to improve uh, uh, positive coping as well as social support. And this is what our data shows, that the intervention also improved positive coping. And this is one of the mechanisms through which a reduction of depression was achieved. The intervention improved social support. And again, this is one of the mechanisms through which the uh, reduction in depression was achieved. So then we looked at the, we, we computed the indirect effects and we see that the indirect effects uh, through positive coping, quite all right, are significant. Uh, but when we look at the indirect effects through social support, we see that they are more than double those through positive coping skill. And when we combine both variables, we see that the greatest intervention effects on um, reducing depression are also achieved through a sequential improvement in positive coping, followed by an improvement in social support. So those were the mental health variables that um, uh, group support psychotherapy was able to improve. And the next question is, were they able to have an impact on the physical health of the persons living with HIV AIDS? Um, so regarding the physical health, we looked at three variables. We looked at um, art adherence, we looked at virus suppression, and we also looked at recurrent infections. And here we see that yes, group support psychotherapy improved art adherence, and yes, group support psychotherapy did improve virus suppression. And it is easy to, to assume that yes, of course, with improvement in adherence came improvement of uh, virus suppression. But we assess the role of uh, both depression and adherence um, in the effects of the intervention on virus suppression. Okay, so these are the two mediating variables. So we now look at the indirect effects that we computed. So when we look at de the depression, uh, indirect effects through uh, depression, reduction of depression, we see that they are small, but they're significant. When we look at art adherence, when we look at the indirect effects through art adherence alone, we see that they are small and they were not significant. And it's only when we look at the sequential reduction in depression followed by an improvement in adherence, 
were we able to achieve a significant uh, indirect effects uh, through these two variables on viral suppression. So what does this mean? It means that infection treatment Um, is part and parcel of HIV care. Depression treatment is needed to enhance um, adherence to antiretroviral therapy, so as to help our patients achieve um, optimum uh, viral suppression. The third uh, um, variable that we looked at, uh, physical health variable, was the occurrence of recurrent infections. Uh, we, we saw that in our study sample, uh, quite a significant number of people reported uh, recurrent infections. These were recurrent fevers, uh, respiratory tract infections, genital tract infec infections, oral candidiasis. So the proportion reporting these infections was quite high at baseline, but as the participants received the intervention, and as we followed them up, the report of these recurrent um, infections decreased. So again, we conducted mediation analysis, looking at whether uh, there were any mental health variables <clears throat> that could uh, mediate these effects that we were seeing. <coughs> So we found that a reduction in recurrent uh, infections was mediated through a reduction of stigma. Uh, we also found that, uh, it, that this effect was mediated through a reduction of depression. So we computed the indirect effects. We look at stigma and we see that indeed the indirect effects through stigma are significant. When we look at uh, depression, we see that the indirect effects are really small and they're just marginally significant. But when we look at the sequential reduction in stigma followed by reduction in depression, we see that the indirect effects uh, um, uh, through these two variables are significant. So this means that the greatest uh, intervention effects on recurrent in infections were achieved through a sequential uh, reduction in stigma uh, followed by a reduction in depression. So what are the plausible uh, explanations for these intervention effects that we were able to observe? So it is impossible that in the long term, I mean, it, it is possible that in the long term, as the participants <laughs> overcame their depression, they overcame their stigma, uh, they had um, uh, um, a better coping skills, you know, there was a reduction in cortisol levels, okay? And this came with uh, improved immune response, you know, uh, which was critical for fighting, uh, let's say, the infections that they were burdened with. Uh, these effects could also be uh, due to um, adoption of uh, uh, better behaviors. Um, for example, with the improvement in depression and, and improvement in, in uh, stigma, participants, you know, were able to have uh, better sleep, uh, adequate nutrition, uh, more physical activity, less use of alcohol and drugs, you know, and this all worked to, again, improve their immune function, you know. And so we saw an improvement in uh, viral load and they were less prone to uh, recurrent infections. And of course, lastly, uh, the treatment adherence. You know, it, 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 it could be um, that with the reduction in uh, depression and reduction in stigma, uh, patients were, were motivated, you know, to take any medications that they were given, maybe the ARVs, maybe medication for their other 
infections, you know, and this resulted in the improvements that we saw. So this uh, research that we did, of course, has some... <laughs> Apologies, apologies. Somebody was wasn't muted. Sorry about that. I couldn't work out what it was. Carry on, please. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, um, I was about to mention uh, some of the limitations uh, that we that we you know uh, had to deal with when we conducted uh, these um, studies. Limitations such as uh, measurement error uh, could affect our results. Uh, the way we measured some variables, for example, adherence was uh, by um, self self report, and also the way we measured our viral loads. Uh, we obtained our viral loads from the medical chart, um, and um, uh, you know so. This could uh, result in this classification bias. Um, there was also a possibility of selection bias because our uh, health workers who delivered the, the, the intervention, you know, there was no uh, um, blinding in this, in this, um, in this trial, uh, given the nature of the interventions. But uh, nevertheless, um, our findings uh, have some implications for health service delivery. Um, it, it is evident with the results that we have that addressing depression contributes to better HIV care and um, management. Uh, it is evident that we need to integrate group support psychotherapy in standard HIV care protocols, as well as uh, chronic disease management protocols. Um, it is important in our healthcare delivery that we provide a supportive, stigma-free environment, uh, especially to you know, uh, the persons living with HIV AIDS, uh, people with highly stigmatized conditions. Uh, it's also important that we build mental health capacity for all our health workers so that we can create mental health oriented health workers so that you know we do not only focus on the physical problems, but we're able to equip our, our, um, our clients, our patients with strategies to manage stress and you know um, uh, prevent uh, mental health problems. Uh, our findings also highlight the importance of income generation, especially uh, in the African context, you know, in which we live in. Uh, ability to generate income will protect our mental health. When you have an income that provides you the basic needs of life, you know, then you can think of, of the higher needs like your mental health. But if you don't have the basic uh, uh, needs in life, then how can you even start to pay attention to your psychological needs? You know, it becomes difficult. So for, for us in our context, in our African context, uh, income generation becomes key uh, in protecting our, our mental health. So how are we using these findings, you know? Um, so at the moment, what, what we are doing is to engage the stakeholders. You know, we need to create mental health awareness among all 
PADAs, I mean, all uh, stakeholders, because if, if they don't know what mental health is, then they cannot, you know, advocate for uh, um, uh, mental health to be an integral part of um, healthcare. Uh, we are then building uh, mental health capacity of our health workers uh, who we want to, we want them to go out into the community, create the mental health awareness, identify individuals with depression, and you know, be able to deliver group support psychotherapy in the villages and thereby bring about uh, uh, um, physical health, social and emotional uh, well-being of our communities. So how are we getting the group support psychotherapy to those who need it? We are using the train the trainer approach. So basically we, we train health workers at the facilities, you know, they return to their facilities, they um, uh, convene the group sessions, after which if they successfully do so, um, they qualify to become trainers. And we do mentor them and we supervise them for their initial uh, group therapy um, sessions. And when they qualify, they can then train the lay health workers at, you know, in, in the villages. And these go to the communities, uh, identify, screen, do the screening, identify people with depression and respond by giving the group support psychotherapy in the villages. When we train the health workers, we ensure that they acquire four major competences. That is, they must be able to initiate contact and build rapport, be able to do the screening, differentiate mild to moderate depression from severe depression, and be able to refer the severe cases to mental health profession, professionals in the nearby uh, health facilities. Uh, the, the health workers must be competent in intervention delivery, and they must be able to use, must be, must demonstrate uh, their ability to use the intervention manual to guide their group sessions. And then lastly, we teach them about self-care, emotional self-care, so that, you know, they can identify signs of personal distress and be able to apply these principles of self-care. So along the way, we have learned some lessons. We have learned that the selection of the health workers to be trained is critical. Not every health worker can be able to do this, but if you get you know, highly motivated health workers, those who have interest in mental health and they're held in high esteem by their communities, they do a wonderful job. We have also learned that it, it's important, you know, after the, um, the uh, five day workshop that we hold or the two weeks, you know, training online, that the health workers need mentorship and supervision as they deliver their first, you know, group therapy session. And we do offer that and they're successfully, uh, uh, they're they able to successfully convene their group therapy sessions. Um, we have also learned that the health workers are very busy, especially the ones at the health facilities. Uh, um, and yet we need them to, to get to know these skills so that they can be able to supervise the lay health workers working in the community. So what we have done is to also design an online group support psychotherapy course that um, facility-based health workers can attend. It basically consists of two hours of uh, interactive discussion every day. Um, and then thereafter they return you know, at, at their places of work, they can then uh, convene their group therapy sessions while they are receiving mentorship and supervision from the trainers. So what is the way forward? Uh, we, we are participating in uh, building mental health capacity for health workers in Uganda and beyond. Uh, we have uh, scaled uh, group support psychotherapy to Nigeria and to Cameroon. And um, in addition to that, we have developed and are, are in the process of evaluating telesupport psychotherapy for youth that they can access using their mobile phones. 
And we have conducted similar uh, studies of group support psychotherapy in young people living with HIV, and we are in the process of uh, publishing these results. In conclusion, our research underscores the profound mind-body connection, urging us to reorganize healthcare as a more integrated holistic endeavor. For persons living with HIV AIDS, addressing mental health issues like depression is not an option, but an integral part of effective HIV care. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for a, a really fascinating and stimulating lecture. Um, and I also just wanted to welcome um, friends and colleagues from Africa who are with us. It's really lovely. It's the upside of Zoom. Um, we'd love to have you here in the room, but it's really wonderful to have you with us. So are there any questions either from the floor here in Scotland or online? would like to kick off the questions? Um, oh, is there somebody online? There's a hand up from somebody online, but a physical hand. So, no. so I'll, well, I'll take, I'll take um, pressure here first and then we'll go to the colleague online. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. I was curious to hear, I was really struck by the finding that income generation really helps. And, and I suppose I was just curious to hear a wee bit more about how that was actually, how you did that, how you how you managed to um, support the attendees to, to um, look at income generation. Were you able to hear that? Oh, sorry, we hope we thought, it was a question about how did you achieve the income generation? We were really interested to hear that income generation had helped. Can you hear me? Okay, um, is the question how we achieved income generation? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, um, that is a very um, interesting question. Uh, when we were developing uh, group support psychotherapy, we did uh, some qualitative research. We went to the community and part of the questions were asking them, you know, how can we design a group therapy to which people will come, you know? And then people, um, the community, they told me, but doctor, you see, we live in poverty. You know, if that intervention can teach us how to get out of poverty, people will come to the intervention. They will be interested. And um, so I went back and, you know, began to read up again on the risk factors for depression. And there it was. Poverty was a potent risk factor. And, you know, it had never really occurred to me that, you know, that this can be part of psychotherapy. But it is what the community asked for. So we went back to the drawing board and, you know, discussed with colleagues, you know, what is it could what, it, what is it that we could add, you know, that could alleviate poverty, you know? And, you know, that's when the idea to, to, to teach them basic skills, basic livelihood skills came up, you know? And so in sessions seven and eight, that's what we do. Um, and, you know, it, it's really so amazing. At that time, at, at, that, uh, at, at, at that time of, of, of the intervention, these participants have really visibly changed. You know, they are so motivated, they are so keen, they're so interested, you know, in the idea of, you know, working as a group. So they brainstorm on, you know, things that they can do within the resources that they have you know, in their community, you know, to come up with a small project. This is nothing huge and fancy, but something small that can generate income for basic, you know, for basic needs, you know, and people are able to brainstorm and come up with all our ideas. The role of the therapist is to ensure that what the group has chosen is feasible, you know, and, and it can be done that they have the resources and that when they do this project, they will win 
You know, because these are people you've lifted out of depression. You want them to win and you want to empower them. You want to show them that, yes, they can do something and be able to succeed, you know? So that's the way we go about it. And for sure, they do work in groups. They come up with, you know, projects, garden projects. They work on them together. Um, they share their proceeds and then they can decide whether they continue as a group or they go on to do individual things. So that's how we go about the income generation. <laughs> this is so inspiring for us. We and Sharon and I, Sharon sitting in the front, we're doing a project um, in Glasgow and we're having a poverty aware approach. And this is very inspiring. Um, now I've got there's a question online, Cesar. Want to unmute? Yes. Um, hi, um, Cesar Alfonso <clears throat> from uh, New York City. Um, also the president of the World Federation for Psychotherapy and a friend of Bethel. Uh, you know, I'm Bethel, I'm really impressed uh, every time I, I look at your research and uh, with, with the elegance and, and of your methodology and how you have really been able to add to the existing literature that uh, showing that group psychotherapy has a robust effect, not only in terms of quality of life, symptom reduction when it comes to depression or anxiety, uh, but also overall health, immune function. Uh, and these are independent effects uh, of group psychotherapy, very powerful tool uh, that I think it's underused internationally. Uh, you know, we know, my, my point is that, uh, not, you know, that's just to congratulate you on your work, but you know, my, um, uh, my question has to do more with uh, how you get to deliver the group therapy. Uh, my understanding from looking at your slides is that the uh, you train healthcare workers and then healthcare workers train lay people from the community and then the lay people are the ones who deliver the group therapy. Um, and, you know, I, I, if, if that is the case, you know, you have really designed uh, a, an excellent model for task shifting you know, 70% of the mental health, health workers in the world serve 30% of countries. In other, word, in other words, most of the country, you know, does not have mental, enough mental health care workers uh, to, uh, to access services. So, you know, my, my question is like, how, um, how do you maintain um, uh, quality of, uh, of uh, service delivery by, uh, you know, through that trajectory of training the healthcare workers, training the, I mean, are you in any way, uh, you yourself linked to the delivery of the groups? Do you, what level of supervision do you do with the healthcare workers, with the lay workers? Uh, or this is just like a cascade where you train the healthcare workers, they train the lay workers, they deliver the service and you hope for the best. I mean, it's, it's how, how do you do quality control of that task shifting uh, cascade. Thank you, yeah. sorry for the long question. Yeah, it's fine, thank you Caesar. It's a wonderful question. It's really a wonderful question. And one that we've, we've also been uh, grappling with, uh, you know, how do we get the health workers, you know, deliver the intervention the way it's supposed, uh, the way it's supposed to, to be delivered. So, um, we are working with the various stakeholders in the country, various implementing partners in the HIV field, as well as the Ministry of Health. So the Ministry of Health uh, has selected us to train, you know, so my team trains the health workers uh, into uh, the delivery of this uh, intervention. We do a, a, a five day, a five day uh, workshop in person, uh, after which we then put all the health workers on a WhatsApp forum, all right? And, you know, we continue providing them with information on that WhatsApp forum. Uh, for example, we continue to guide them on how to give a health talk on depression. So we have audio recordings on, you know, how to talk about uh, depression in the local languages. You know, how do you talk to people about anxiety? How do you talk to people about anxiety? So 
the health workers have these uh, recordings with them all the time. And, you know, they can continuously listen and be able to observe, to absorb this um, information. Then we also mentor them as they convene their groups. So when each health worker uh, has selected maybe their number of, pati of patients with, with depression, they, they, are, they are assigned a supervisor. You know, and so this supervisor is, is able to journey with this health worker. Before the health worker meets the group, uh, they have an interaction, you know, they make a session plan, you know, and the supervisor makes sure, you know, that the health worker has all the key things on their plan. Then they go for the session. Then afterwards, they have a discussion of how the session went. If there were any challenges, they discuss with the supervisor. So we have found that this process is very key to help the health workers get started. Where there is no supervision and mentorship, indeed, they will not start. You know, they will not be able to uh, convene the um, uh, 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 sessions. But when we mentor them and supervise them, uh, they are able to convene the sessions. And, you know, they are able to observe the changes that we expect, you know, the, the participants' uh, mood lifting up, you know, them practicing positive coping skills and generally the improvement in depression, they are able to observe that. Wonderful. Now, I think there was a question in the room and then there's a question online. Was there a question down here somewhere? Yes, thank you for this talk, um, Edgar. Uh, Dreda, I uh, would like to ask about whether there were any gender effects that you found and what the gender composition was in your sample. Did you, did you catch that? What was the, what were the, yeah. <laughs> the gender <laughs> composition of the sample. And any gender effects as well. Oh, gen, gender, gender, gender effects. Okay. So the gender composition of the sample, it was more or less, uh, the male to female ratio was more or less one to one. And we've been able to achieve this because of the, of, of, of the gender sensitivity uh, that, we, that we employ, um, given that we, we train equal numbers of male health workers and female health workers. The male health workers are responsible for recruiting the male participants. You know, they engage them. They talk to them, they give them the, the depression, the health talks on depression, you know, and they're able to convince them to come to therapy. So, uh, you know, because we use equal number, we train equal numbers of male and females, we, we were able to attract more or less equal numbers of uh, males and females. Now, any gender effects were observed at 12 months. We first did an analysis at, at uh, 12 months, and this is the paper we published in the, in the Lancet Global Health. And we saw that actually there was a greater reduction in depression in males. Uh, okay, faster reduction in depression in males compared to females. But at 24 months, uh, that effect was no longer there. Uh, both genders uh, experienced equal um, reduction in um, depression. Uh, we have not conducted any other gender analysis yet. Fascinating. I think we only have time for one more question. There's a question online that's from Chima Rondu, and I've just lost it. Um, and it's asking, stigma is one of the barriers for people living with HIV to engage in interventions. How did you manage to overcome this barrier? Um, come again with that question. How did you overcome stigma? How did you overcome stigma, which is common in people with HIV, to, to yeah. attend the interventions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very, very good question. Uh, actually, uh, I think we're able to impact uh, the stigma that these participants felt because we have a whole session. Session six is dedicated uh, towards uh, learning coping skills, uh, learning how to cope with stigma and discrimination, okay? And uh, this session always starts with uh, sharing experiences about stigma, you know? And, you know, we all experience stigma in various ways, in uh, various circles. So we all have stigma stories. It is not just the stigma of mental health disorder or the stigma of 
HIV. So usually this session, the health worker, the trained health worker leading this group is encouraged to share their own personal stigma story, you know, to set the ball rolling. And this usually motivates all the group members, you know, to share their stigma experiences. Uh, so after that, the health worker then, you know, uh, uh, um, teaches them various coping skills, you know, that they can employ to cope uh, positively, you know, with whatever stigma that, you know, that is being uh, um, uh, um, thrown at you for any attribute that you may have. You know, you are taught how to cope in a positive way uh, with that stigma. And we see it in the data that actually there was improvement in the stigma uh, felt by these uh, clients. There was a great reduction in um, stigma. And we see that it is, you know, that it, it is through that stigma reduction that we're actually seeing uh, health benefits as well. Yeah, so it is something that we address specifically uh, in the group therapy. Thank you so much. We unfortunately don't have any more time for questions. I could go on all day. Personally, I have learned so much from this session and I'm sure I speak for the audience in that. Next time, we would love to invite you to come to Scotland. We can show you around the campus. We would love to welcome you here. But it was absolutely wonderful to have you with us and we just want to thank you in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.